Out of the seven isotopes of hydrogen, tritium has the longest half-life at 12.3 years. The lighter deuterium and hydrogen are considered stable, while the heavier isotope of mass 4, 5, 6 and 7 have half-life that defy the concept of time itself and deserve a video on their own. For this video, I wanted to focus my attention on tritium. With two extra neutrons, the nucleus of tritium undergoes better decay to helium-3. An interesting consequence of this transformation is the melting and boiling point of tritium. Tritium melts 7 degrees warmer than hydrogen and boil 5 degrees hotter. The decay product of uh, tritium does the opposite. Helium-3 boils a full degree colder than helium-4 and is less than half its density. Tritium radioactive decay consists of the ejection of an electron with a weak average energy of 5 keV and a maximum of about 18. This is too weak to penetrate more than a few millimeters of air and is difficult to detect. The rest of the energy is carried by the antineutrino. I explained this process in the carbon dating video, link in the description. Because of this weak radiation, tritium is uh, sometimes used in glowing sign and gun sight. This keychain has about 30 millicurie of tritium or about three millionth of a gram. Some exit signs may contain up to a curie of tritium. The better radiation cannot escape the container and their energy is converted to light by a phosphor. This is the same radioluminescence effect used in alpha scintillation. The total dose accumulated from carrying this keychain all year is minuscule and should not concern anyone. The energy dissipated can be radiated in x-rays by brainstalum breaking radiation. This is not easily detected and this Geiger counter does not see anything. A gamma spectrometer may be able to see a slight background increase in the lowest part of the spectrum here. But to zoom in on this area, the X-ray spectrometer does a far superior job. Notice the energy cluster around 15 keV as expected. For this reason, tritium radioactivity was not detected until 1939, a full five years after its discovery. Some tritium was formed after the Big Bang, after the first few minutes of the universe's existence. Today, tritium is naturally found on Earth, mostly from cosmic rays interaction with the upper atmosphere. Nitrogen-14 can split into carbon-12 and tritium when hit by a fast, high-energy neutron. The conditions exist at the aircraft flying altitude and above to generate some tritium. 55% of all radiation experience in flights are neutrons. Here, I recorded a six and a half hour spectrum during a transatlantic flight. I accumulated a pathetic 0.4 millirem, which is typical, mostly from high energy neutron, electrons, and photons. Outside of exit signs and glowing gadget, Tritium is an excellent fuel for nuclear fusion. The deuterium-tritium fusion has the lowest threshold for ignition and lithium can be used to regenerate tritium as it is consumed. The 1954 Castle Bravo test is the prime example. Nuclear power plants do legally release tritium in the environment. Although one out of 10,000 fission generates a nucleus of tritium, the main process for tritium generation in PWR is through boron. The NRC set the limits in its 10 CFR Part 20 regulatory form in order to protect the uh, general public. The goal is to not exceed 100 milligram per year for individuals of the public. Tritiated water should not exceed 37,000 becquerel per liters. In the US, the EPA set the limits for drinking water at 740 becquerel per liter or 44 dpm per milliliters. Compare this with the activity of the already 12-year-old water at Fukushima recently released. 190 becquerel per liter is low enough to be safe to drink. Just like carbon-14, tritium is detected using liquid sunlation. In nature, tritium, like hydrogen, associate with oxygen to make water. Surface water may contain up to a single backhole of tritium, which is far below my detection limit, but I tried anyway. Tritiated water in the form of T2O is somewhat concentrated by distillation, but it's unlikely to be found in the environment. 
the HTO form is far more common. Therefore, distilling the sample is perfectly fine. In fact, the EPA method 906 for tritium in drinking water recommend distillation to remove potential interference. And with that in mind, I collected uh, some sample of common brands of drinking water. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I could not detect anything above background. I tried rainwater and waited for a different rain event. I could not see anything either. I measured standing swampy water as well as running water during drought and again after rain events, but still could not get any tritium. With high hopes for Lake Erie, I reanalyzed my Great Lakes sample, but still came up dry. Since uh, tritium is the byproduct of nuclear power, the only place on Earth I could even get a chance at detection is the only country that uses the most nuclear power, France. So I went there. I collected two samples from two different rivers, the Saône and the Rhône. Since the Saône does not pass any nuclear facility, and the Rhône does, I can establish a baseline and compare the two rivers. Now, of course, I did not go to France to only sample rivers. I also had to sample the food and the wine, the nightlife, and all the advantages of a well-deserved vacation. The Saône is a quiet plain type of river with a lower flow and more time to soak in its environment so chloride, carbonate, and TOC are higher. The Rhône is a faster moving river it takes its source in the higher elevation of the Swiss Alps from melting glaciers, so it carries more sulfates from erosion and because of the sampling point in the city, more nitrates. It also passes the Buget plant with the four 900 megawatt reactors north of Lyon and offer a higher potential for tritium presence. I'm not gonna build up the suspense. No, I did not see much of a difference in these two rivers at all. The reason is simple, detecting a single decay per second in one liter or four per gallon is extremely difficult. Carbon-14 works because its activity in the environment is 200 times higher than tritium. So was this a complete waste of time? No, not really. If you're still watching, I managed to entertain you for seven minutes and 36 seconds. But more importantly, monitoring of the environment can be done by amateur. The equipment used in this video was top of the line in the not so distant past. They still allow the detection of low, mild, and severe pollution. Getting more than one source of data is indispensable to mitigate corruption and special interest. Sure, this is just a silly YouTube video and I have no credential, but I have no reason to lie either. The power of science resides in its ability to be cross-checked and criticized. In the end, you're free to believe what you want but nothing is stopping you from doing it yourself. Constructive criticism is always welcome. Thanks for watching.